Hi, I am Cameron Miller, and this is a reflection on the readings for the 22nd week of Pentecost from the revised, New Revised Common Lectionary. And this is from Trinity Place in Geneva, New York, and I want you to know I am stuck. <laughs> yeah, I am stuck on reading this lesson from the, a reading from the Gospel of Mark in a particular way. Stuck back in May or June of 1980, as a matter of fact, when I graduated from seminary in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the dean of my seminary <clears throat> gave the graduation sermon. He delivered a point so surgically that resonated with me so powerfully that I can never forget it, and I can't see beyond it when I read this story. Whereas normally, when I come to a reading from the scripture, I come to it over and over and over again. I discover something new, frequently something new every time. I'm shocked by how often I discover something new each time I come to it. But not here. But please don't get me wrong. That does not mean that I haven't violated many times the point of this, or the points of this reading of Mark. Um, I never forget it, <laughs> but I have violated it. Now you might say <clears throat> that the tale that Mark tells doesn't have much of a bark, let alone a bite. It's just a homely little story, really. Just ten sentences long. Ten sentences. Yet, as the dean of my seminary pointed out, those ten sentences, on those ten sentences, hinges the whole gospel of, the, of Mark. Now, this is what I mean. It takes ten chapters, ten, <laughs> ten chapters for Mark to tell the story of three years of Jesus' life. It takes him six chapters to tell one week. Yeah. So, ten chapters for three years, six chapters for one week. And that pretty much sums up the emphasis of Christian theology, too, more's the pity. Ten years for the three years of Jesus' life and ministry, six chapters for one week towards the end of, at the end of his life. So remember, as we think about Mark, he doesn't bother to tell or to include all that uh, virgin birth mythology. It's not even clear he knew anything about it. He starts with Jesus as a grown man, a mature young man, who has an amazing spiritual awakening at his baptism. It starts with a kind of big bang. Yeah, all of a sudden, one day a spectacular event changes Jesus' life and the history of the world going forward. For ten chapters, Mark tells stories that lead up to Jesus' fateful decision to take his Galilean roadshow to Jerusalem. Ten chapters to tell us about three years. Then the next six chapters to describe his last week in the city of Jerusalem. The hinge between these two episodes is the story of blind Bartimaeus. And a good story it is. The first point that our dean made, certain that we understood, if we hadn't learned it already, was about uh, this distinction between ten chapters and six chapters. This ten-sentence story of course, it's a microcosm of everything in the ten chapters leading up to this moment and a foreshadowing of the six chapters describing the death of Jesus. So here are the pertinent bones of this skeleton. First, the story of blind Bartimaeus takes place on a stage that's dripping, I mean really dripping with drama. We don't necessarily know this when we're just reading these ten little, ten little sentences. But Jericho 
was an incredibly opulent city in those days, a resort city, in fact. It was, in Jesus' day, the home of the summer palace of King Herod. We have descriptions of several uh, palaces in Jericho at that time, but also of grand and uh, sunken gardens in just ordinary homes. It was a very opulent place. It's no accident that the hinge upon which this big story swings takes place then in Jericho. Jericho is the intersection of the world in those parts. Literally. I'm not kidding or even, you know, being too dramatic. At Jericho, two Roman roads met like crosshairs in a sniper's scope. There were only a few roads in the world that could uh, host chariots and heavy traffic, not like today when we need GPS just to decipher all the varicose veins on the page. At Jericho, two of those fortified heavy roads met. One went straight to Jerusalem and, to, and Damascus, and the other one went all the way to Rome. It was the point of decision. It was an intersection of decision where Jesus and his followers had to decide. And it was a moment that split past and present, safety and danger, control and vulnerability. Turn back and they could go home again. They could go home to the people and the places that they knew best. Back in the smaller villages and towns of Galilee, where Jesus, uh, Jesus' rural images and down-home zingers aimed at the principalities and powers were much appreciated. Turning back would take them to the people among whom he was popular and well-loved. It would be safer and wiser. But... He turned instead the parade toward Jerusalem, from Jericho up the hill to Jerusalem, to that urban citadel of Roman occupation and religious authority. That's where it was unclear what would happen or how they would be received. In that cauldron of political and religious power, Jesus would probably be, review, be viewed with suspicion. And it would be dangerous, too, because troublemakers and agitators got rubbed out like bugs on a picnic table in Jerusalem. So the stage could not have been more dramatic or evocative than the intersection of those two roads in Jericho. An opulent playground of military and political power where past and future intersect. The dean said that at that very moment, time stood still. He, like many Christian theologians, liked to talk about chronos and kairos, or linear and vertical dimensions of time. I don't know about all that, but it was a big moment. There are such moments in human history, of course, moments of where the Hang time is just a little bit longer, in which momentous events seem to stand still just a little bit longer, and, and pulsate just a little bit more than all the moments around them. Though we don't have any real-time record of many of those moments, blind Bartimaeus and Jericho is that kind of moment. Now, I don't think, at least in my memory, that our dean mentioned this part. But at that huge moment on the stage of human history, Bartimaeus threw off his coat. Now, you may not have noticed that in the story. It's not very noticeable in those ten little sentences. Certainly wouldn't have noticed it uh, on the scene, at the scene with the big crowd and everything else going on around it. May not seem like a big deal to you and me because we probably have multiple coats for multiple seasons. But that man, Bartimaeus, had one possession in all the world, one. 
is coat. That was true for thousands and thousands and thousands of indigent people in Jesus' day. You had one possession, your coat. It's what kept you warm at night and that you could sit on in the day. And unless you also happen to have a staff, it was likely the only thing you had. His one possession, and he throws it away. Now he's blind, remember? So finding something that he threw away is not like you and me tossing something to the side that we'll come back to later. Rather, it was a huge, huge risk. He was in the midst of a crowd, and he threw off his coat and moves toward the voice that's beckoning him. Now, in the cold calculus of life, trading a coat for the ability to see may seem like a reasonable idea. But what made him so certain at that moment that it would end with him being able to see? Now, that's half the story. The other half of the story, the one that our dean emphasized because we were all going to be pastors and preachers and that kind of thing, wherever it was we were going. The other half of the story is that Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. That makes me think of that poem. To be held by the light in the fashion of a tree and to receive that light and take it in as a tree drinks it and sends it down into the tunnels of its roots, winter, summer, spring, or fall, and reaches into the unfurled leaves and feeds the substance of its core. To be held by light and to drink it in Jesus stops the whole procession. He stops at the very procession, the very intersection of time and history on a stage so consequential we could say that the history of the world balanced on it. To have a huge celebrity Someone everybody else wants to see and hear and touch and know. To have somebody like that stop. Stop everything and focus on you. Well, that feels like being held by the light. When someone is important or busy or important and busy doing such important things, but they stop and they look at us anyway. They stop and touch and hold us anyway. Well, it feels like we're being held, being held by light. The first part of that is that Bartimaeus risks the only thing he has in hopes of having his life changed. And the second part is that Jesus stops everything and everyone for the sake of one blind beggar. You see, it's a very big story, even though it's only ten sentences. Now, of course, the question is, what's it got to do with us? Well, that's pretty simple and stark. First, if we want our life to change, if we want our life to change, then we have to take a risk. There's no way around that, really. I don't know why it's that way. I don't really like it being that way. I only know it is that way. Want something to change? There's a risk for that. Secondly, if Jesus can stop the procession of time and history for a beggar that everyone else wanted to silence, then we can stop our little bandwagon for the needs of those around us. I mean, really, 
what makes us so special that we can't stop what we're doing and listen or tend to the needs of someone who is at the margins of our attention. So it turns out that Mark is a dang good storyteller. Ten sentences that speak volumes to remind us of two profound bits of wisdom. Want to change? Take a risk. <laughs> Want to be like Jesus? Stop. Just stop what we're doing and listen for who needs us. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Dean Harvey Guthrie. And thank you for being part of this worship today and for listening. Peace be with you.